everyone, it's Michelle Lee, and it's time to get real on Real Talk. Hey, everyone, it's Michelle Lee. Of course, Jason and I, all we had to do was get a bunch of young guys. I just saw it. I'm up for the best Southern gospel hair in a bluegrass category. <laughs> I made this suit for you and I buried it. It was all awesome. <laughs> good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We're all set to get real. Okay. Good. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. You got me in frame, right? Okay. Yeah. Frame Let's frame roll, Sammy. Wow. Hey, guys. Hey, hey, Michelle. Well, guys, it's so great to have you guys being part of Real Talk Bluegrass. I hope you guys are ready to get a little real. Because we're not just going to talk about bluegrass. We're going to dig a little deeper into your souls <laughs> and Let's have do fun it. doing it. <laughs> so first and foremost, of course, uh, both of you are nominated for uh, IBMA Awards this year. Uh, Carolina Blue nominated for uh, New Artist of the Year. This is your second year being nominated. Of course, you have a brand new album out as well on Billy Blue Records um, that is called Take Me Back. You guys just had your uh, album release event that was in person and virtual, right, Bobby? Yes, um, we we've been lucky through the COVID. We picked up a uh, a corporate sponsor throughout all this. It's a local restaurant in our town called Hogwall Barbecue, and so we've been doing all our virtual concerts from their venue on Monday nights because they're closed. And uh, when we decided to do our CD release party virtually. Um, the owner said we can comply with the COVID regulations and offer about 20 folks to come in. So we sold 20 tickets and we didn't have one single local person there. Everybody flew in. We had people from Michigan, Alabama, Tennessee, South Carolina. So it was really cool. And uh, we sold out of the records that we had there that night. And, uh, you know, from for those folks and uh, folks ordering online. So it, it was different. It's uh, this whole COVID things it's just been hard on everybody but we've been fortunate that we've had uh, some great success with online concerts we're all uh, really close together we all live close to one another so that's an easy thing for us to accomplish so we've been really lucky right, yeah. in that regard well I'm glad and I, I was able to catch part of it I know um, we're, we'll talk more about the album and that um, as well but uh, to welcome Rick of course you you guys uh, special consensus nominated not for just one but four IBMA awards um, entertainer of the year album of the year for uh, Chicago barn dance the song of the year title cut track and the collaboration um, recording of the year for the same song as well with the Chicago barn dance and and Ricky this is gonna be a, a great feeling coming out of you know coming out of your solo album as well into Rand's brand new album um, and celebrating Chicago and it's in its whole and in its entirety because that's where Greg is originally from correct absolutely born and raised there in Chicago yeah it, you know it, um, He's, he's been there for so, 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 so very long. Uh, <laughs> I think I think they moved to town just after the fire. I, think. I, I could be wrong. Uh, uh -huh. Don't quote me on that. Anyhow, yeah, we're, we're very excited about Chicago Barn Dance and everything that it's been doing. Uh, we're seeing it start to hit the airwaves and catch some support, and uh, we're very excited about that. Um, and... Uh, the Rick Ferris album, you know, Breaking in Lonesome, I was just tickled with how well that has done. Um, and looking forward to doing official showcase this year, um, you know, at IBMA. Um, you know, working that together, that's, that's been a trick during COVID. Uh, but we actually haven't had uh, gigs with special consensus. We have gotten together to play um some online video for a festival, the CBA festival, the Father's Day festival out in, mm -hmm. I think it's Grass Valley. But uh, we, we did that, and that's been a couple months ago. So uh, I've been playing every day with guitar, writing a ton of songs, playing for the baby. Uh, but it, we've just been enjoying life at home, and uh, we, we've got our, our new little one who's seven weeks old uh, wow. today, actually. So, um, yeah, just enjoying being a dad, getting that honeydew list ticked off so well, well you know that's one thing we, we got to congratulate you on that because uh you guys welcomed kent 
to the family. Um, you have a, another son, Parker. How old is Parker? And I mean, this has got to be a huge adjustment because I know there's a few years different. Yeah, he is 10. Um, and, uh, you know, Parker, we, we wanted a kid pretty much immediately, another another kiddo, but we uh, we started to recognize pretty early that uh, some things weren't, weren't quite what we were expecting. Um, when you read the what to expect when you're expecting, but, um, <laughs> And we, we started noticing that Parker was having a few issues with some things, and uh, we had him tested, and he had autism, has, has autism. So we wanted to make sure that we gave him every bit of an upper leg that we could. Uh, we really focused on his care and, and therapies that we needed to do. Um, that's that's the big gap. But uh, but he's doing amazingly well. He's, he's sharp as a tack, um, and uh, just just loving watching him fill that big brother role. He's doing so great. So it's been a blessing to be home during this time. So, um, and Bobby, what kind of advice can you give to Rick? I mean, I know you got a few kids of your own and a few of them, uh, you know, I believe you had a daughter who just had a, a birthday not too long ago. My oldest daughter turned 23 today and uh, I'm so proud wow. of her. She's, uh, she's such a, a kind soul. She's beautiful and creative and smart. Um, and, and my youngest, my youngest child is six. So there's a big, big, uh, gap between that and Rick. I, my oldest son is also autistic. His name's Zachary and, and he's, uh, he'll be 22 okay. on his birthday, uh, Thank this you. year. Yeah. Um, well, and then I've got a, I didn't yeah, know that. We need to talk some more after this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, um, it's, it's, Certainly, challenge. He's pretty high functioning, so uh, that's. Uh, but that's certainly, of course, a challenge. Um, but I've enjoyed being at home as well. You know, I, I missed a lot. My middle son just turned sixteen, and he's a phenomenal athlete for his school. And I know last year we were so busy that I missed. I got to see like three football games, so I was watching online and listening. And it's it's hard to miss those things. Uh, and so I've enjoyed being home. Of course, there's been no sports or anything uh, happening, but I've just really enjoyed being with my family uh, during this time as well. Yeah. So, and that actually, that's one of the, uh, one of the questions I was going to ask you guys is like, what have you guys been doing? Um, I mean, obviously preparing for the albums coming out. Um, it's been keeping you guys on your toes and getting you busy. But you know, during COVID nineteen, it's uh, downtime. I mean, obviously having a new baby is not really much downtime, but what have you, been, you guys been doing, you know, outside of music um, to keep you guys busy during this time, besides, you know, along with uh, visiting and being with your family during this time, Rick? How about you first? Okay. Well, um, I've, I've had a lot of fun, like I said, you know, getting things done around the house, but, um, you know, I had a couple of benches, cast iron benches that needed wood you know wood slats done on them probably for oh i don't even know if i want to say how long <laughs> they've been waiting for uh for wood and finish to be done but uh, you know I, I was enjoying using the hand tools instead of all the big power tools that i have at the shop which is about 30 minutes away at my folks house um but uh you know just getting getting stuff done that honestly we've been so busy touring for so long that I, I just haven't been able to keep up on. Um, yeah, you know, not getting a whole lot of sleep with the new baby, but um, really getting a ton of time to, to go out for runs with my son, Parker, and now Kent, we got a stroller that's got the bike tires we can, can haul it. Um, but getting in bike rides and, and running and um, lots of songwriting. I've had a bunch of songwriting sessions with a good friend of mine, Rick Lane. Um, and we've been writing a ton of songs, getting ready for a new Rick Ferris record, hopefully in the spring releasing. Um, and building guitars, repairing uh, a 1945 drill press, um, you know, getting that ready for, for the shop because the old, other one I had wasn't, wasn't as good. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just essentially doing nothing but work, work, work. But, <laughs> but being home every night has been nice. And, and Bobby, I mean, you guys have been busy, of course, getting this new album ready and, and set up uh, and released. Uh, 
you know, with uh, everything going on. But outside of that, what keeps uh, Bobby going? What keeps your your, your mind going uh, in, in the positive way? Well, I have uh, for the past six years, I've been managing a landscape company in Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, I couldn't tell you how many times in the past couple of years since we've gotten really busy that I've thought about giving that up. And I'm so thankful to the good Lord that I kept, I, I powered through that because that's really kept my family going, you know, financially through this mess. And um, we were lucky. Um, a couple of our, our band members were able to draw on employment. So they have had some steady pay coming in throughout the summer. But, you know, like Rick, I've, I'm a landscaper and I've got the worst looking house on my street. So I've been able to, uh, to do some work in the yard and, uh, you know, we did, we did some planted some trees and some shrubs in the yard this year and, and remulched it. And, uh, you know, just hanging out with the kids, working, working the 40 hour week and, you know, trying to rehearse. We, we've put this record out. We were still in the middle of the recording process when this, when COVID hit and our studio shut down and uh, for a couple of months we were just sidelined and it pushed our release back a couple of months. We wanted to get our album out in time to make IBMA deadlines and that didn't happen uh, because of COVID, but that's okay. Uh, we were able to go back in in May and wrap that up. And um, I really wish I, I really wish I had some time to, I wish I could say I've been writing a bunch of songs, but I've just been so busy. Uh, with <laughs> labor that I hadn't been able to. Well, so the fact that you guys are both parents and, um, I, and of course, Rick, you've performed with your parents on stage with your, your family and everything growing up. But can you share with us one of the most memorable lessons you've learned from your parents? Um, Bobby, how about you first? Um, just my, my poor little dad just turned to 80 and uh, up till about, you know, 10, 12 years ago, that man could still outwork me any day of the week. He could, he could handle a shovel or a hammer like anybody's business. And my, my dad built houses for a living. And, you know, from, from my dad, just a work ethic, you know, that if you want something, you know, you work hard for it. My dad's never had a credit card in his life. You know, he thinks his mentality is if I don't have the money to buy it, then I don't need it. And, uh, mm -hmm. he's, he's a really hard worker. And, um, I, I just learned that from him, you know, just if you, to set a goal and work hard to achieve that goal. It's always wonderful. Wonderful. And uh, Rick, how about you? I mean, like I said, you know, your you guys, you, your family has been in the business a long time, but whether it's business related or not, um, what is something that your parents, you know, has, uh, has left a memorial, uh, memorable uh, lesson for you? Well, I, I think the one that really was the, the most profound, I mean, there were times dad, dad had the, the pearls of wisdom down. He was an avid reader of Mark Twain. And, um, you know, there, there was there was a lot of knowledge being thrown around. But uh, the one that really, like, stuck struck me and stuck with me for a long time is whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when I was younger and learning to play guitar, uh, I was seven years old, I think, uh, and I, I had already kind of given up mandolin and fiddle. I didn't like them much, and and Dad said, uh, "It's like, well, you need to you need to learn a C chord." And I'm like, oh, "I don't want to. It hurts." And he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and he said, "Well, you know what? It's like, whether you think you can or you can't, you are right." And we're about to be joined right here. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hey, Parker. <laughs> hi, Parker. Well, and as we're saying hi to Parker, I, I thank everybody that's already joining us, like Rick, Steve, Rick, uh, and Oliver. Uh, and that if you guys have questions, let us know. We'll uh, do our best to pop them up in there and get them answered for you. Or um, our hitting man, Mr. Sammy Passamano, will take care of uh, all that for us. <laughs> but uh, so as as you guys are going down memory lane, <laughs> what is something something that instantly right now that you could think of? Don't think too long. You smile from one of your memories, Rick. Sorry, what, what was that? I missed the last little. What is a, what is a, a memory of yours that instantly that you could think of that makes you smile? 
uh, from special consensus? Anything. Anything. Oh, well, um, <laughs> I don't know if this is going to be asked later, but, uh, you know, one of my <laughs> favorite stories of, about us with Greg Cahill is we were, uh, we were up in Pennsylvania at a bluegrass festival and, uh, we we're always up to nefarious things and having fun with each other, pulling practical jokes. But uh, we we pulled the sprinter up to the porta john when Greg went into it, <laughs> and we, we pinned him in. He couldn't get out, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh my gosh, we have to record this!" And so we got video tape and everything. And eventually, he's like, "You see the door go, bang, 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 bang." bang. I was like, okay, we better back it up or he's going to bang up the front and then he's really going to be upset. And he came out, oh man, he was so angry. He was just like, where are you guys, you know? <laughs> but we we had such a fun time and he laughed. He came out laughing and he was red as all get out. But when he saw the video footage, he about died laughing. And he's like, yeah, you got to put that up on Facebook. <laughs> so we're all really good sports and we dish it just as much as we get it. So we have a ton of fun. That's good. That's good. Got to keep it light. Got to keep it light and having fun. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> How about you, Bobby? Um, something that I love and it always makes me smile is all my kids play sports and um, I love watching them compete and play. We're, we're really competitive. Now, my youngest daughter, Ava, is six and every night we play trouble. You know, the game where you pop the bubble and move around, try to kill each other and get around the board. I mean, we do this every night and she is ruthless um, about trying to kill me and make sure I don't get around that board. So we're, that's not the memory, but I'm just explaining how competitive the Powell household is when it comes to games and sports. But um, I, I guess my son was playing Little League and up until the time Carolina Blue got too busy for me to do this, I was the I coached in our county Little League in our recreation uh bark and um i was coaching third base and when he hit his first home run and i remember i was running with him when he came around third i was running and I, when he got to home plate he came and we hugged and i picked him up and that's just something that makes me smile that first home run you know oh yeah oh yeah i know that feeling i played sports my whole entire life mm -hmm. man. <laughs> me too <laughs> so whether this is uh, something um, musically or just personally, what's something that inspires you guys the most in your life, Bobby? Um, I, I tell you, my wife inspires me daily. Uh, I talk about, I don't talk about Kayla a lot when I'm doing interviews and things, but um you know, she's, she's the mother of my youngest. We were, we've been married for nine years this year, but so she's not the biological mother of my other kids, but you know, I, I had custody of my other kids and she came in and she's raised these kids. She left her career to be a stay at home mom when she, she had her baby. And I mean, it's really inspiring to me how she, uh, you know, puts the things that she loves aside to, to, serve us you know and she's get, just got a servant's heart and uh that that really inspires me every day she doesn't get enough credit i could i certainly couldn't do what i do with my music if it weren't for her so that's something that inspires me every day i think about that every day and rick what yeah. inspires you oh uh you know you you're 100 right bobby and i i can't talk enough about my wife uh, i'd regularly bring her up in interviews because I, I would not be here without her. Um, when I was actually, when I was trying, well, the Ferris family had decided uh, that we were going to curtail things and, and stop touring because my brother Eddie had been hired by Ricky Skaggs and Kentucky Thunder. And uh, we, we had some replacements for a little while, but it just wasn't the same. And when we decided we were going to uh, to disband, we had several months notice. And uh, I, I went looking for a job, talked to some friends, and I found out that Greg Cahill was auditioning mandolin players. I was not a mandolin player. <laughs> and uh, I, I played guitar and dobro and banjo, but Greg said, uh, you know, well, we, we'd love to have you. You're a great singer. Um, can you play mandolin? And I was like, uh, I can't. But I said, but I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, and, uh, you know, I put in the CD that, uh, that I'd had for a while 
of Special Consensus, the new record. And I got to the first fast song and I was like, what in the world am I thinking? This is a terrible idea. <laughs> and, and my wife said, can you just give yourself some credit for one second? Like, can you just like, just try, okay? She was, um, I think she was six or seven months pregnant at this time with our first. Um, and uh, she was working a full time time job as a ZMS manager at Walmart. So she was over 12 different departments, pregnant as all get out. And she said, I will do the house, you know, cleaning, you know, cooking, whatever. I'll take care of everything. If you just lock yourself in that office and learn how to play mandolin, because we need you to get this job. And, uh, you know, I, I cannot, I, I've not met anybody else who would do something like that. Uh, when, when I'm full of some self doubt occasionally, She's always there to, to say, look, you can do this. You just need to do it. Um, and she is, she is absolutely my rock and my inspiration. Um, so, so what, um, so what made you guys both to decide to get into, uh, music? Was it because, uh, for you, Rick, was it because your family, um, was in the business and, you know, you felt that was like the direction that you really were supposed to go to, um, to be in the business? Um, you know, when we, when we first started, it was just kind of like falling out of bed for us. Dad, uh, dad always was a professional musician. He played with Reba McIntyre in the eighties. Um, you know, he, he was a touring musician when we were really little and he gave all that up. Uh, when we started asking, where's dad, <laughs> you know, <laughs> four boys just weren't running around and, um, driving mom nuts. Um, he decided to, to give that up and come home. And just about the time he thought he was giving music up, period, is when we started to get interested in it. We went to an occasional bluegrass festival, and uh, and he would. Come here. Oh, where to film the hot air balloon? The hot air balloon. Okay, hang on, Daddy's telling a story. Can you sit here quiet for just a second? Okay. Okay. So, uh, or or go if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we we saw the Bob Lewis family in Missouri. And uh, they were a family band. They were probably eight or 10 years older than we were. And we're like, hey, why aren't we doing that? Like, we're a family, you know, <laughs> what gives? <laughs> and uh, dad started teaching us like, well, okay, well, if you're interested. And we, we had a talent contest at school and we wanted to all do something individually. Dad said, well, why don't you do something together? You're, you know, you guys could be a band. And we learned I'm being swallowed by a boa constrictor. <laughs> that was, our, that was our, our breakaway song, you know. And we had such a fun time in front of our peers there at school. Uh, it was kind of uh, addicting right away. And, you know, Dad was like, well, okay, we'll see what these the boys say they want to do it. He, he booked a tour. And I remember I was like 13. And Dad said, it was like I just hauled off and hit Muhammad Ali with everything I got. And he just looked at me and smiled. Because he was expecting no. us to be like, oh man, no, we can't do this. This is hard work. And we were like, let's do more. Come on. <laughs> so we, uh, it was literally like falling out of bed for us. We, we were just, I don't know, I guess born to be on stage. We had too much fun with it. That's good. That's good. How about you, Bobby? When did you realize that you, you want to do, <laughs> do more My than landscaping? <laughs> every day uh, <laughs> no my, my story is a little different than than rick's um i started attempting to learn to play guitar when i was 18 years old i graduated high school but i grew up loving music yeah uh, my mom was a big country music fan and i remember she had a radio on top of the fridge in the kitchen that stayed on all the time and i mean this was in the 80s this one when, when country music was still good you know you had skags on there and still playing george jones on the radio um, so I grew up, woke up listening to that. I loved it. I loved all kinds of music, but, um, in high school, um, I started dating this gal and, uh, her best buddy played in a bluegrass band. Uh, a girl, she, she was a girl played mandolin in a bluegrass band. And so we would follow them around the area here and go to all their shows. And I bought all their albums and stuff. And, and that's what really got me started loving the music. And from there, you know, I got into, I uh, seldom seen and 
Osborne Brothers, Allison Crafts was big at that time. Um, I just got into all that stuff. And when I was a senior in high school, uh, I don't know, uh, it's been so long, I can barely remember. But uh, <laughs> the last few weeks of the year, you know, you don't really have to do anything. And I, there was a couple of dudes, and then the, the girl I was telling you about, I graduated with her. And so they were bringing their guitars to school and just hanging out at the field house or in the auditorium or wherever, just jamming. And I was there, you know, and I decided I wanted to learn to play the guitar. And so uh, when graduation rolled around, I, I got a bunch of money, you know, and all the family was giving me cards with $20 or $50. And I went over to Asheville and bought me a Yamaha guitar that had a neck on it, like a two by four. And I bought a little book that showed me how to make the chords. And I started trying to learn and, Fortunately for me, my dad's brother lived right next door and he played banjo and guitar and uh, about anything with a string on it. So he helped me out a whole lot. And um, I just started slowly learning. And, and that, that was in June. And, and by fall, I um, start, started playing with a local gospel quartet. And it was there that I met Tim Jones. And we've kind of been picking music together ever since. So it's just it's been a little bit of a whirlwind. I wish I'd started as a youngster. Maybe I'd be a better player. But hmm. um, as <laughs> as far as knowing that I, you know, this is what I wanted. It's always what I wanted to do. You know, uh, when I figured out I wasn't going to make it playing baseball, you know, I wanted to play music. So it's always been a dream of mine, and I'm so grateful um, for Carolina Blue and that we're we're you know we've been at this uh, this band. It's our thirteenth year as a band, and we're finally starting to uh to get somewhere with it i feel like and i'm just so thankful to you michelle and anybody out there that's played our music and and t i remember those early days trying to book shows and nobody knew who we were so it's hard to book shows and you know when when you dj started playing our music a little bit we were able to start uh, booking some festivals and and here we are it's like a, a little snowball when you start rolling it down the hill and it just got gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and and uh, I don't know, man. I, I don't know where it's where the times went. It's just uh, I just feel really blessed to be where I'm at today. It's been a dream come true. So has uh, Timmy been growing his hair that to get to that length since you met him back that day? Let me tell you something. Uh, he's not here right now. I don't know if he's watching. Don't really care. I'm going to say it anyway. Now, when we when we started this band, Timmy Jones wore a crew, a military crew cut, and that's all he would wear. So you, I would, I never would have thought in a million years that he'd have long hair. But uh, and I, I, I started out giving him a little hard time about, it, and then I felt guilty, so I've kind of slacked off on that. I'll, I'll make a remark here or there on stage, but these little old <laughs> ladies at the festival, son, they love it. They're like, "Don't you fuss at him because of that hair? It's so pretty. Don't you ever cut your hair, son?" <laughs> uh, I mean, he's starting to look like a, he's starting to look like Crystal Gale with a goatee. Honestly, it's getting it's getting long. Oh, I love man. him. I, he knows I love him. <laughs> so, so Rick, we got a question for you about Greg, um, because you know it seems like every day is Greg's birthday. What the heck? That's go what's going on there? Oh, he's ninety-seven, and and we feel like uh, you know we should celebrate every day because we don't know how long we're going to have it. You know, right. <laughs> No, no, he's uh, he's seventy three, and uh, you know the the whole thing started with uh, Timmy Dishman and uh, let's see Josh Williams and oh my goodness Jamie Clifton, the Route Ten band, and uh, so two thousand two. This has been going on since two thousand two. He's been dealing with this since then. <laughs> wow. Um, and uh, they at that. every restaurant they stopped at. They I don't think they'd ever do it on stage, but. You know, just about every restaurant they, sorry, <laughs> just about every restaurant that they'd stop at, they'd <clears> find <throat> the maitre d' and say, hey, it's Greg's birthday. <laughs> and, you know, every time they went to the restaurant or whatever. And, uh, you know, it, it, it had kind of calmed down uh, when there was a quick bunch of turnovers. And, uh, let's see, it, was, it would have been around two, 2009, 2008, somewhere around there. Quite a few band members changed over and it had calmed down and he finally thought he was done with it and then uh, let's see uh dustin benson had uh his first kid um 
and he took a leave of absence for a few weeks, and we had Jamie Clifton come back <laughs> as the temporary <laughs> guy, you know, to fill in. And he, that was the worst decision Greg could have ever made. <laughs> because instantly it was, it was uh, you know, the bottle of uh, Pendleton was, was brought on. <laughs> and we were having a great time. And then all of a sudden, happy birthday came out. And we're like, oh, what's this? <laughs> oh, this used to be a tradition? What are you talking about? So he, uh, yeah. Yeah, he, he's been dealing with it now again for, for about 10 years since I've been in the group. So. Wow. I mean, it's just always funny. You randomly start seeing people saying happy birthday. And, you know, of course, uh, Oliver uh, had asked, you know, why has he got so many birthdays? And that's pretty cool. It's, it's funny, but it's like you can, since you travel in different places in so many different states, you could definitely get away with that, I would think. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, Ollie, I, I see. That's my friend from Germany. Um, yeah. yeah. So he also gets regularly birthday cake. I don't know why he complains about this, but he gets birthday cake more than anybody. You know, I mean, that's a pretty good deal, right there. That's a heck of a perk for a guy who's eighty-seven. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, you know. uh, the way he plays the banjo, it comes right off. You know, <laughs> he's got a lot of effort. There. <laughs> so. If uh, if you guys could help me kind of understand your something about yourself uh, a little bit more, what is uh, your favorite thing about yourself, Bobby? <laughs> I, that's a tough. One. Uh, I, I've got pretty low self confidence, so I don't really have any favorite things. Um, I don't know. I I, I kind of you know think. Th think that I'm a pretty good dad. I try to be anyway. Um, mm -hmm. I always try to be a good example for my kids. And, um, you know, even when I'm not with them, you know, when, when I'm out in the public eye, I, I try to just always say and do things that would make my kids proud of me. Um, so that I guess that, that would answer your question. I just always try to be a good example for my kids. Do you think it's, um, hard now for the fact um I'm, I'm, i'll have rick answer here in a minute but do you think it's harder now because the fact that social media is so big and everything pretty much everybody does goes on social media whether you post it or someone else posts it do you feel like you you definitely have to you know protect yourself and your family in that way as well yeah. A absolutely and yeah i've had these conversations with kayla my wife about just being aware when you're posting on social media, a lot of people know that you're my wife and, and, you know, she doesn't post things that, that shouldn't be posted, but you know, it's just conversations that we've had. And I, I remember, you know, I, I learned a few years ago to stay out of the political talk on Facebook and I mm -hmm. always keep that to myself. You know, I, I posted some stuff that, you know, on my personal page and, and got some backlash from, from, from fans and, and even friends about it. So, you know, that, that taught me the lesson with social media and, and with my kids too. I don't, I don't allow my son finally got a Facebook page. He just turned 16 and I allowed him to have a Facebook page, but uh, my younger kids don't, they don't do social media. Um, I let them, I let my daughter, I've got a, a 13 year old daughter and she, she had, does Instagram and stuff, but she always, if she's going to post a picture, she always uh, checks with my wife or myself to make sure that, it's okay if she puts that up. Uh, you, you have to be mm -hmm. really careful with, with that, with that kind of thing, you know, and you're always, Rick knows this, you're always in the public eye when you're, uh, I don't think I'm famous or anything, but, uh, you know, thousands of people, thousands of friends on Facebook and, and the band's got uh, thousands of followers, you know, people, people follow you and then, you know, kids look up to you, people look up to you and you just always want to be a good example for, for people. Yeah, exactly. How about you, Rick? What's uh, your favorite thing about yourself uh, that you could share? <laughs> um, or really, yeah. I want you to share. <laughs> I'm kind of with Bobby, you know, uh, I, I think it's a musician's mentality to always be like, yeah, I suck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because because a, a good musician, the, the, the way you get to where you are is by looking at where you suck. <laughs> like all right. the time. Like, okay, this G run is not good. I need to work on that. Okay, well, this rhythm sucks. I need to work on that. So 
um, there's a lot of self analyzation that is always going on, and there's it it causes this constant revolving door of self analyzation and and sometimes self doubt. But um, I would say my favorite thing about me, although it's irritating for some people, uh, namely my wife, sometimes is I'm I'm always in the moment no matter where i am what i'm doing who i'm talking to if i'm talking to a fan um you know i i try to just let the world fall away and pay attention to them if i'm talking to my wife i try to make sure that nothing else uh you know is is gonna impede something you know i I try to give everybody everything i've got all the time and it's i'm not always successful you put me in front of a television i'm like (laughs) <laughs> I, i'm a tv bug but you know i try not to ever be around them, but um I, I try to always be in the moment enjoying my time wherever i am whatever i'm doing whoever i'm talking to and i try to look for the positive um, that's what keeps me healthy <laughs> So, you know, you guys talk about like words and, you know, what you say is and being in the moment. Um, words can always take a different meaning when whether you're saying it or how it's said. Um, what is more important to you is is it what is being said or how you say it? Rick? I, I think they go hand in hand. You, you can deliver a great message with terrible, uh, you know, execution <laughs> and it, and it's just not gonna it's not gonna carry the the weight that you want it to um you know you, you've got to have the right message and you have to deliver it right it's the same with music i think you know you, you can be the, the best lead guitar player in the world but if you've got no rhythm guitar behind it uh you know that's what you do 90 percent of the time you're a terrible guitar player <laughs> so it, you know, and the same with singing. You can have beautiful lyrics, but if somebody sings it like a computer, who's going to want to pay thirty dollars to see that? You know, uh, right. I, I think I think both are key. Um, communication is is one of the things I try to be very clear and very poignant every time I can be, uh, because uh, that's, that's part of the reason why I hate texting so much is because you cannot get the color, the flavor of facial expression, voice inflection. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, this will be it's kind of like a two part. So the fact that um, you guys are both in bands, um, that's a key thing is communicating with your fellow band members. And I think, you know, whether it's how you say and how what you say, I mean, it is going to really determine the relationship that you have with your fellow band members. And Rick, you've had, you know, you've been in Special C for several years now. You've worked with numerous different artists um, in the band um, and have had members leave and new members come. And I think, you know, that's a a pretty much a a good way for folks to understand communication within the band is key, whether you how you say it and what you're saying, but also to other bands as well, because they're human, they're individuals and you're at shows, you're 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 communicating and you're having and socializing with them um, at each event. So that kind of comes full. full. Sorry, you cut out just a little bit. That It comes full circle, I think you said. Yep, that's exactly it. OK. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it, absolutely. You have to be able to to work on it a relationship with a bandmate it's essentially like being married twice uh when Mm -hmm. you tour as much as we do you know the those those folks that you spend the time with on the road not only do you have to maintain a decent enough um composure on stage to entertain people like if somebody's up there just like you you can tell (laughs) they're not having a good time yeah they're, they're not gonna brighten people's day or make them forget about their worries and cares for a little bit which I think is key for, for music, you know, is it, it lifts us up out of whatever we're dealing with. But, um, you know, music can transcend past just individuals and become a unit. And to do mm-hmm. that, you have to be on good terms. You all have to be heading in the same direction. Mm-hmm. You all have to want the same kind of thing. Even if you have to come about it different ways, like you've got to be marching towards that same goal, even if it's 
as individuals your own way. But like, um, so I, I think you have to spend just as much time honing those relationships and those bonds. Uh, you know, you have to care. Um, and, and you have to be accountable to yourself and to others. Um, right. It's not just playing on stage. That's the easy part. Mm hmm. Uh, it, yeah. it's, it's being in a car for 23 hours. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> but it's, it's, part, it's part of it, you know. Um, when we were touring regularly, I would get up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And I would get a shower, run out the door, you know, with my, my suitcase and guitar, hop in the car, drive an hour and 10 minutes to the airport, get on an hour plane ride to Chicago or Nashville, then get in the Sprinter, and drive anything from like 20 minutes to 15 hours mm -hmm. to get to the first gig. And then, wow. you know, like that's just to get there. Um, so that that's the job, you know, playing for people and having a smile on your face and in your heart. Uh, that's that's always been easy for me because I, I enjoy visiting with people. I enjoy playing music. Um, right, exactly. Yeah. How about you, Bobby? I, I agree with everything he, that Rick said. Um, uh, you've got to be able to get along. And um, I think that really, really played it, it for us in the hiring process. We've we've had to change members a few times. And I, I feel like that a few times we didn't make a good hire. And um, just like with our fiddle players, Ainsley, who plays fiddle for us now, um, is a perfect fit for us. Um, but, the, but the guy who preceded her was not, and we didn't really vet him like we should have. Um, you've got to Carolina blue, honest guys. It's like, I'm not lying at all. We're like a, one big family. We, we razz each other. We give each other a hard time, but we lift each other up too. Um, we spend a lot of time together. Um, I spend just as much time with those guys when we're touring as, as I do at home with, with my family. So it's really important. Um, you know, there's been times when, when things have been a little tense and that sure shows on stage. Um, it's hard to, to enjoy what you're doing when there's things that are going on that, you know, that might affect you negatively. Um, so we, we try to, if, if there's, we've learned this, that if there's, if there's something, if there's a problem, let's go ahead and, and air it out and get, get work through it before we get up there. Cause we want to, you know, give it our best shot when we're, we want to give our best effort when we're on stage in front of the crowd. I agree a hundred percent with what Rick said. So if you, um, as, as we're talking about bands and about being in the band and traveling in the vans and the vehicles and, and things that like that, obviously personal space is very limited. So <laughs> what do you guys do? <laughs> what do you guys do to help, keep the strength of, you know, your temperament and keeping, finding that personal space um, when it's possible. Um, Bobby, how about you first? Um, well, we purchased an RV uh, in the spring of last year and that really helped with that. Um, we've also got a female in our band, which, you know, she, she needs her personal space when, when it's time to get dressed for the show. So, um, it's important, you know, if we're multiple days at a festival, you know, we might uh, work together, be together. But, you know, when, when we're not playing after we're done with the merchandise area, we might go our separate ways and just get a little a little alone time. Um, but I think that's important, you know. Um, and usually when we're tra traveling down the road, uh, we'll 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 talk and have a good time with each other for an hour or two. And then it's like, everybody's got their headphones in and they're listening to their music or watching. Timmy's always driving. So he's always listening to you no know, Del McCurry or ACDC. One of the two, usually when he's driving the, the rig, but, um, uh, you know, I, and I'll be watching Netflix with my headphones in or, you know, listen to a game if my son's playing and, uh, you know, everybody likes their space. Um, and it's mm -hmm. important. It's important. It is. How about you, Rick? What do you guys do? Oh, well, it's very similar. Um, you know, when we are driving sometimes, you know, we're really committed to, to visiting. 
And sometimes I, I think this is what's really great about this particular band is we're okay that there's some silence occasionally. Um, you know, we're, we're is that because of, Greg's hearing aids aren't up? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, um, you know, one, one of my favorite things to do when I'm driving actually is to listen to an audio book. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the guys are always paying <clears throat> for that because I mean, the, I, I, I try to pick some really interesting stuff, uh, but I, I like classic literature. Um, and, uh, you know, I also like Sherlock Holmes and whatever, Tarzan of the Apes. But, you know, so there, there's there's a lot of things to draw from that will entertain other guys. But uh, it's same with me. Like, if, if it's not uh, Del McCurry, it's it's Leonard Skinner or, or <laughs> you know, whatever, Johnny Lang. So, somebody that's really got some uh, electric prowess. But um, I actually, I started running to get some time away from from people um and uh, i kind of enjoyed it a little too much when i started i was up to 13 miles within like four months which is really wow. too to, to build up mileage but uh so i got shin splints which is unfortunate but uh I had to go for walks then <laughs> to get some alone time but you know finding a vocation like reading you know people don't interrupt you unless it's a necessity uh if you got a book in front of your face but yeah, knowing knowing that people just need space sometimes and not taking it personally, I think mm -hmm. having enough security in your own self that hey, I, you know, I'm an interesting person, and if somebody doesn't want to talk to me, it's fine. You know, people need space sometimes. Um, so yeah, it, you, you get used to that, but it's tough when you first start touring with people, and you're not used to it. It's it's like a, like a new new set of clothes you ain't used to wearing. Yet. Yeah, so, that's right. you, <laughs> so uh, speaking of clothes, <laughs> I mean, you guys both have great styles. Um, you know, obviously, Bobby doing the lax look tonight, um, which is good. And, you know, like Rick said, he uh, hasn't worn the hat for several months. So, you know, it's a, it, it's his signature look, just like you have your signature look. Carolina Blue has her signature look. And so does Special Consensus. Um, how do you guys decide and who decided to, you know, make that presence, um, make that decision to, hey, we have to really make ourselves, you know, be professional looking on stage and, you know, come off the stage and, you know, relax um, and, and kind of make that impact in your shows? Because it, I think it changes how you perform and how you interact with the fans um, on and off. Um, Bobby, how about you? How about how well, does Carolina work? When we first started, you couldn't pay Tim Jones money to put a suit on. Honestly, <laughs> he he wanted to wear jeans and boots and, and button down shirts, and that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. But we were working for Roy Chapman here in North Carolina, and I'll never forget this. Um, Roy said, boys, you should always dress better than the folks who are paying admission to come and, and see you. And I believe that, um, yeah. you know, Monroe, Monroe did that. I've heard some stories from Mike Fagan and Blake Williams, you know, that he expected them, even if they had an off day to be wearing their cowboy hats and and uh, dressing like show people. But um, it, it got serious when we started, you know, hitting the festival circuit and getting out there around America a little bit. You know, we, we weren't a hat act then. We just wore, we wore suits and ties. And um, I am a little embarrassed to say that I my hair started falling out when I hit my late 30s. So, and I wasn't about to be a shiny cue ball up there. So I decided that I'd get a hat and Tim likes hats. He's a cowboy. So, so we got hats and, and when we hired Ainsley, I think that uh, put us into another level about, uh, she coordinates all our dressing, you know, we'll be getting ready to go out on the road tomorrow and we'll get a text saying, okay, guys, we're going to wear the black suits and red ties tomorrow. Um, so my battery's dying. I may have to plug my phone in here, but, um, she, she coordinates our dress and, um, she does a good job with, with that. Uh, yeah, but I, I mean, it just all stems back to respecting your audience and, uh, Want to look good for them and, mm -hmm. and 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 entertain them. You know they like. I believe the audience likes seeing the band dressed up. I don't 
think an audience because I don't like going and and listening to a band that's wearing ripped up jeans and t-shirts. I don't have anything against it, but you know, if it's you know between watching that or watching a bunch of guys that are wearing suits and taking their job seriously, I I choose the guys in suits ten to one. Right. Yeah. Exactly. How about you, Rick? You got the flair going. Yeah. Well, um, that that kind of came from my dad. He we always wore suits. Um, you know except for when we were like really little kids, like when I was like 10 or 11 or 12, like it was, it, we all coordinated, but it was polo shirts and khakis because we were kids, man. We couldn't stand the heat. Sure. Uh, we'd sit there and just complain the entire time. But um, when I got into special consensus, the, the outfits were different then. It, it was just, uh, you know, some, some nice shoes and some dress jeans, dark, and uh and you know like just a, a nice button down shirt um but greg's been uh, you know making music since jesus walked the earth so uh, <laughs> they've gone through some uh, some band changes in terms of like bolos were were popular once upon a time <laughs> and uh you know real skinny uh 1980s ties you know but greg's always you know, changed with the times, but always had a look about the band. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when I joined the band, I started wearing ties because I've always loved wearing ties. I like to learn different knots to make them look unique. Even a simple tie with a cool knot really dresses it up. But I love wearing a vest. I love wearing a tie. I always have. Um, and I, I think when I started wearing ties, everybody else was like, well... Well, all right, then we're going to wear ties tonight, <laughs> you know, um, but we always have, have taken pride in, in looking good because, you know, I don't remember who said it, but uh, people hear music with their eyes. That's Since right. MTV has come, uh, you know, it's no longer radio. You know, people hear music with their eyes and, and if they're impressed with what they see, they're going to be more apt to listen to what they're hearing. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, you look at who's doing well in the business. Del McCurry, you know, there's not many folks doing much better than Del McCurry. Del is always in suit and tie. The, the boys look great. Um, Rhonda Vincent's always wearing a nice dress. The boys are color coordinated or whatever. Uh, you know, people, when they take themselves seriously, they're going to be taken seriously. That um, it, it's so true. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, well, like you, like Bobby said, you know, you want to make a presence on stage that, you know, that shows you paid X amount of dollars to come to this uh, festival. I'm maybe here for, you know, 45 minutes only, or I'm here for two 45s, but you have to leave them with an impression of you as an individual and as a whole, uh, as you're in part of a band. I think that's a, a key thing. And, you know, that right there kind of explains, why you guys are nominated for what you're nominated for, for uh, the 2020 IBMA awards. Again, uh, Rick Ferris um, nominated with special consensus for entertainer of the year, album of the year, song of the year, um, recording of the year, co uh, collaborative uh, recording of the year for, uh, you know, uh, Chicago barn dance on the last three. And, you know, a year that there's ties between album and entertainer of the year. And you guys are in there in those two categories. And, of course, Carolina Blue, your second year being nominated for New Artist of the Year. And both of you all have uh, amazing projects out. Of course, Com uh, Compass Records is the house of uh, Special C's, uh, Chicago Barn Dance with Allison Brown and uh, Billy Blue Records uh, with uh, Carolina Blue. And, you know, everything that, you know, Jerry Sally has done for Billy Blue Records. And, you know, it just kind of mirrors what Allison has done with uh, uh, Compass Records. And then, of course, Stephen Mojan and Yana. Um, with Dark Shadow recordings, and that's where uh, Breaking in Lonesome is on. You guys have definitely been keeping you guys self busy, um, and and that. But you know, as you think about how you've been staying busy, and and here we are, we're getting ready for the virtual World of Bluegrass Week. And of course, Rick, not only are you uh, showcasing, but Special C is as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you guys are going to be very busy that week, um, and you know. Preparing for the virtual world of bluegrass, I think, is a, a, a unique thing because of the fact that social media has really stepped up in the platform for artists 
to keep their music alive besides radio because you're staying socially active with your fans and Bobby I mean like you guys with your album release party and you guys do your monthly shows um, and events that um, kind of you know are tying it all in keeping your guys' name and your face out there is a key thing um, you guys also just premiered on Bluegrass Music TV the video for one of the songs on the album um, to plow um, yeah, that's, that's, our, that's our new single there. So there you go. I mean, you, people got to check that video out. That's for sure. And, you know, as you guys are, you know, getting prepared for what's ahead in the next month and a half, and you look at what's gone on because of COVID-19, but can you, how do you envision um, what you guys can do as individuals or as a whole as a band to keep things strong? Um, for your fans. Um, what else can you do? Rick? Um, you mean just at IBM? Or are you talking uh, just period? Just period. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, I started doing something. And when it got close to Baby Kent being born, I, I've slacked off. But I need to get back on it. I started doing uh, uh, Want to Hear Wednesdays. And mm -hmm. I would interact with folks. They'd suggest a song for me to learn and it didn't matter the genre uh and we you know was getting anywhere between 30 and 55 submissions a week and uh we'd put it in a a, a uh like a spin the wheel generator and it would figure out what we were going to do this next week uh and i had a lot of fun learning those tunes and uh it was a challenge it got my ear you know used to listening to different music and really trying to figure it out but also it there there's there's fun it, it's never going to be a polished thing like if i would put it on stage but i mean i've got a week to learn it what <laughs> what do you expect <laughs> but the whole thing is is, is um, finding a way to, to interact with folks and still have a moment with them when i can't see them personally um, right right because I, I i do love to visit with folks and catch up with them see how they're doing ask how their parents are doing or or what have you um you know, and uh, I find that I, I have a real hard time getting on Facebook just because there's so much uh, media, if you want to call it that. <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of stuff being thrown around that just kind of brings me down and into a dark place. And I, I don't like that. So I love yeah. to messages i love to to put out content that i can interact with fans and friends and family um and not just the whole world that's on facebook um, right I, I love to to meet with folks and interact with them but but kind of not on the world's terms on bluegrass's terms mm -hmm. right totally understand that how about you bobby uh well i mean rick's right i think for any genre of music in this present day, um, social media is key. Um, our band started gaining popularity right as you know the social Facebook was getting popular, and we've always tried to capitalize on that. Um, we've tried to. We're all right here together, so that we're able to get together and do these live shows. And we started it out once a month, and you know. I see stuff on there like bands are getting on there every day or twice a day. And, you know, I feel like it's a little bit of overkill. We really didn't want to do start do a twice a month thing. But, you know, it, it we were getting to the point where we, we needed to make some money. So um, so we, we went from once a month to twice a month. But it's just figuring out a way to engage your fans. Um, about a year ago, Carolina Blue started an e-newsletter called The Blueprint. And I think that was really great. And and we use that as a way to put more personal things in. You know, we, we'll put stuff about what's going on with the band. But, you know, I'll put stuff in about, you know, my kid slam dunked his first. He got, got his first dunk in a basketball game last week. Or, or Timmy's like, you know, I, I killed two hogs this week. And we got plenty of meat put up, you know. Uh, just stuff, personal things. Because I believe that people, you know, I, I feel like that the people we meet, uh, just like Rick Lidiaco, you know, met him a few years ago at IBMA. And now I consider him a close friend and a buddy of mine. And we will talk on the phone. We'll text each other. 
And, you know, I feel like I like to get personal with people. I like to get to know mm-hmm. people and I want people to know me and, 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 you know, just social media, it's about all we've got right now. Um, as far, as far as interacting with our fans is social media. Yeah, Indeed. exactly. So, so talking about getting a little personal, here we go. I'm going to ask you guys something personal. Do you guys have any tattoos? And if you do, what's the meaning? <laughs> Bobby, <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to call me first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've got a tattoo. Uh, and I'm not going to show it to you, but I've and, got oh, it's in that space, huh? <laughs> yeah, this is personal. You know, back in my younger days, you know, I was running with my high school buddies, and you know, we we was drinking a lot of beer and liquor back in them days, and uh, we we'd, we'd we'd had a pretty hard night drinking and partying and having fun and my two buddies that I was with were going to go get, they decided they wanted to go get tattoos. And uh, I didn't want a tattoo. My mama had threatened my life. If I got a tattoo, she hated tattoos. Okay. So I was, I was a little scared, but I was still pretty ripped when we got to the tattoo shop and uh, Lord, I, it's as embarrassing to even tell people I was drunk, but I was pretty drunk. And um, so we were in there and of course, peer pressure took over and my best buddy, uh, Jeremy Owen, he, he's like, man, I, I really think you should get a tattoo. You know, we're all best friends and we're getting them. So you ought to get one. And I'm <laughs> like, well, dude, I don't, re- I don't really have, you know, the money to get one. I spent all my money on booze. And he's like, I'll tell you what, if you'll get it, I'll pay for it. And I said, all right, what, what are we going to get? And he said, well, if I'm paying for the thing, you've got to let me pick it out. And oh, so no. I, I said, okay. <laughs> and, uh, so he, uh, he got to flip it through a National Geographic magazine, and uh, I've got a nice uh, tattoo of a longhorn sheep, on my, on, which is it could have been a lot worse. It could have been one of those ladies with all rings in her neck or something, but it was a longhorn sheep. I was able to keep that thing hid from Mama for a couple of weeks, and then when it got all healed up, it wouldn't hurt me anymore. I walked out of my bedroom with uh, with uh out of shirt on one day and she saw it and my poor mama cried for two weeks at least oh. over <laughs> that and i've hated the dad blame thing ever since i'll never get another one don't have a thing in the world against tattoos but i remember how much it broke mama's heart that i got it and i'm so embarrassed to let everybody know how i was out boozing the night before but i don't do that anymore <laughs> uh, but uh there's my there's my story sad <laughs> That's a good How about you, Rick? Uh, yeah, you know, so uh, I'll, I'll no. <laughs> no um, I I don't have any tattoos. Uh, you know, I, I had some wild and crazy friends, but I I never really got wild and crazy until I got hired by Greg Kale. <laughs> All right. No. Yeah, we'll um, go with that story. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. Uh, I, I guess I was I was never drunk when I was drunk around a tattoo parlor. But <laughs> don't get um, drunk around a tattoo parlor. <laughs> no, I, I had uh, I had three other brothers to encourage me, but uh, also dissuade me when it was a really bad idea. Um, <laughs> and you know, Greg, we're we're all about having fun, but uh, never to the point of stupidity. Um, <laughs> so I, I've had some really great role models and. I never did. I never did walk away with a with a, uh, a tattoo. But um, my wife says uh, that the only tattoo she would let me have <laughs> is a, a to do list, so I could remember to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a terrible memory, except for directions. If I've gone anywhere one time, I can get back there, even in the dark. Like it doesn't matter. I, I've got an incredible sense of direction and a good memory for that. But you, you say something, and uh, uh, 10 minutes later, I'm like, now, now what was that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Rick and I, of course, are uh, the 2020 class of leadership bluegrass. And class one of ever. our best class ever, exactly. <laughs> and one of the biggest discussions that were going on um, during leadership bluegrass was the, the genre of bluegrass and the subgenres of bluegrass. Um, you know, Bobby, you guys play, you know, you have your sound, you guys have your, your 
today now traditional sound of course and special consensus has their sound of bluegrass and you know what how, how do you guys feel about the different subgenre of bluegrass and the different varieties from the contemporary to the today's and you know yesterday's traditional to the new grass to the jam grass mixing that in with the old time music and i mean how has that impacted what you guys do and how you guys decided to do your style of bluegrass bobby well i mean we love bill monroe and but i'm telling you right now we're not trying to copy bill monroe i think you know it doesn't matter you got to do your own thing mm -hmm. you know you and and you've got to be happy with what you're doing you know um I, I feel like there's room at this table for everybody. Um, I don't, I don't want to copy what anybody else is doing. If we do, if we cover a song, we're still going to do, put our little twist on it. You know, we're not going to try to copy anybody. Um, Woody Platt, who plays guitar for the Steve Canyon Rangers is a close friend of ours. He produced our first record and he told us, you know, you're not going to make it singing other people's songs. You've got to sing your own songs, which is why we've always tried to, to write our own, our own stuff. But, you know, I like it. You know, it doesn't have to be traditional bluegrass for me to enjoy it. I love, I love it all. Right. Uh, I think, mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's so many talented people in our business uh, today. And I love the diversity in it. You know, I love that when special consensus comes on, I know it's special consensus, you know, and I hope that when Carolina Blue comes on the radio, people know that it, they recognize us because of our sound. Um, you know, we've, I, I've got also got my beliefs that, you know, that that Mr. Monroe created this music. He's the father of it. He and he created it. And I feel like that he had a template that for what he thought the music should sound like. And mm -hmm. what we're trying to do with our music is stay within his template. But we're doing brand. We're doing our own our own songs. You know, we're just trying to do them, you know, within the template that he created. And uh, right. people that are getting outside that temple, that's fine too. That's what they're that's what they're trying to do, and we're trying to do our thing and love it all, man. We gotta we gotta support each other in this and lift each other up and uh, not beat each other down, you know, because there's room for everybody. We just we're a big family. We need to act like it. Well, I think that the the great part of being diverse in the genre of music, and and you know, obviously for a radio host. <laughs> It's amazing because you can mix it all together and blend it together and you wouldn't even skip a beat. Um, and I think that's the key thing for festivals when they're hiring bands, the promoters, you know, they want that uniqueness because, you know, you need you want to draw on the fans. And the, the way it's going to be drawn in is drawing in all and bringing in the artists that give you that great mixture. And, you know, um, you know, Rick, we <laughs> I've you know, we experienced some heated discussion during Leadership Bluegrass on this topic. Yeah. And, you know, how is your how is your view? Um, on this? Um, because, you know, obviously we we touch base, but a lot of others in the class were, you know, definitely, you know, kind of mind blowing for me. I mean, it was, a, you know, amazing to see how everybody was feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, variety is the spice of life. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I've always maintained that, you know, variety creates interesting, you know, interesting products um you want to stay true to a genre of music or you should say it's something else but you know there's nothing wrong with a, a musical genre having you know boundaries pushed uh because th there's a lot of beautiful things created um when, when different influences come in um i would say special consensus has had a variety of influences over the years I especially since Allison Brown has started producing the records. For mm -hmm. um, but really, I mean, the quality just had to be there. It didn't matter necessarily where the, the song came from. I mean, we, we've done Big River, which is a Johnny Cash classic. It's an amazing... <laughs> Way to go. Sorry, Sorry yeah. about that. My phone was dying and my charger wasn't working, so I'm going to come out to the car and see if it'll charge up while I sit in the car. Can you go get me a double cheeseburger while you're at it? I'm thinking about <laughs> getting one of those. Yeah. <laughs> hey, is that ever happened, Michelle? Anybody ever gone for takeout while? <laughs> no, but they should. That's correct. Yeah, right. right. I'm going to Dairy Queen. That's it. I'm off the diet. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but you know, 
it, it's uh, I love listening to Larry Sparks and mm. and uh, you know uh, Ralph and Earl. Um, you know, listening to Bill Monroe, Kenny Baker. I, I and but then I love listening to somebody else just completely bend and and contort things in a different way. I love listening to uh, Tales from the Acoustic Planet from Bella Fleck. I mean, mm-hmm. man, you talk about just great music that's heartfelt that moves you. Um, I don't feel like we have to put it in a box. Uh, yeah, it'd be great if it if it wasn't like in a different factory, <laughs> but. Um, but I listen to blues and, uh, you know, I love listening to metal, rock, uh, jazz. I love gypsy jazz. So, you know, I've got a diverse palette. Not everybody does. Some people like to listen to the same five songs over and over and over again. And that's cool. Yeah. You know, but okay. they're going to go see those bands, those festivals. And, and that's cool too. Like what I'm saying is, uh, my personal belief is that uh, things should be interesting. There should nobody should sound like exactly like somebody else. Um, you know, otherwise w- one of us is is uh, not needed. <laughs> you know, um, but you know, Bob Wills did have five different bands during the war. Uh, I don't know if you've ever uh, read a biography of Bob Wills, but he he had a reputation for having a drinking problem. <laughs> but they, because they'd go into a festival or whatever, and one of his cousins or a brother, uh, but anybody who had the last name Wills could front a band, and they'd say, "Well, Bob's feeling a little under the weather, but I'm his brother Bill, you know, or what a cousin Bill or George or whatever, and we're gonna play some music for you. So hope to get your dancing shoes. Here we go, you know, and then they jump right into it. They're like, "Oh yeah, he's yeah. A little under the weather." <laughs> <laughs> but he fronted five or six bands and kept over 50 musicians employed during the, the great depression in the wartime era wow. um so man you know uh <laughs> that there's that they were all playing the same material but it's because they were trying to keep musicians employed during a hard time sure um you know i i think bob wills had a sound Bill Monroe had a sound. Larry Sparks has a sound. I think the reason those people are who they are is because they don't sound like anybody else. That's right. Del McCurry regularly pushes the envelope of bluegrass, and it doesn't get any more traditional than Del McCurry's voice. That's right. Um, yeah. You know, he, he is my favorite bluegrass singer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then maybe right behind him is Larry Sparks. I mean, those cats, oh, my goodness. Uh, I, I love listening to trad music i love listening to to everything else too so so if if you can rick tell me right now if you could think about without looking what is the last song you listened to an artist or artists and uh it actually was del mccurry my love will not change but that's because i'm I'm getting ready for a wedding and uh (laughs) i was sitting there you know Finding love songs in bluegrass and beyond to play at the wedding, but um, but you know before that actual like just listening to an artist. Yep. uh, It was Johnny Lang "Lie to Me" album, Uh, and it's just because like that's that's my go-to running soundtrack. Uh, Love it. It's good stuff. If you haven't heard it, how about you? Phenomenal record. And he was like 16 or 17 when he cut the record. It's just so good. Wow. How about you, Bobby? What's something that was the last thing you listened to? The last song I listened to was by my favorite bluegrass band ever, the Nashville Bluegrass Band. And oh, it was yes. Tear, Tear My Still House Down. That's one of my favorites. It's on my Spotify list. And I was listening to that. And right before that, I was listening to my favorite country singer, Farron Young, singing Hello Walls. That's my favorite country singer, Farron Young. I mean, my nice. Spotify list has got Dale on it. It's um, It's got uh, she took the Tennessee River on it. A uh, special consensus. It's got Buck Owens. I love Buck Owens. I love Farron Young. Uh, it's 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 mainly bluegrass on my list, but I love classic country. I'm I'm not a huge fan of today's country music, but I love uh, I love the classic stuff. I love George Jones. Love Farron Young. Uh, Buck Owens. Marty Robbins is a favorite of mine too. But uh, 
Uh, Dale McCurry, of course, is is not only one of my favorite, but Carolina Blues favorites. We Dale's a big influence. Uh, we love doing those little twin mandolin and fiddle stuff like like uh, Ronnie and Jason Carter do. Um, uh, the song I wrote, "Grown Cold," I kind of tried to write a Dale McCurry song uh, for Timmy to sing, and it, it's it's got a little bit of that flavor to it. Last thing is Nashville Bluegrass, man. They're my absolute favorites, man. Those guys knew how to to pick and sing good material. They never did a bad song. Everything they did was awesome. They're my favorites. Phenomenal arrangements so, and singing, man. It's good stuff. The um the the other thing that I kind of want to kind of deep a little deep and, <laughs> and 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 ask you guys, of course, you know, is as you look at your life, you think about it. You know, you guys are fairly young guys and um if you <laughs> if you can sit there and just watch your whole life in a movie and uh, just see it how it's planned out to this point bobby do you think you would enjoy, would enjoy it um you know up to this point you know there's things i would probably like a do over on i mean i'm not I'm not proud of every decision I've ever made, but I love where my life's at right now. Um, looking back on it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. And so if I can, if I can shine that light for somebody else and uh, uh, show people the way and, and be a blessing to somebody else, um, I, I, I think I've got to be happy. I'm, I'm really happy. You know, I'm just a poor country boy. Uh, don't, we don't have a, a lot of material things, but we got a lot of love in our house and the Lord lives in our house too. And, uh, I just want people to know that, you know, I, I just want people to know that I'm a child of God. And if at the end of my life, if I could look back and if I could see that I've, I've, I've shown some people that, uh, I'd be real happy with it. Mm -hmm. How about you, Rick? Would you enjoy your watching your movie? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm only 35. Um, He's so young. My short movie, I think, but <laughs> but I, I think I would enjoy it, you know. Um, and and I, I think it would be a, uh, a story. I mean, I would hope of of uh, possibilities and encouraging. Um, so you know, I mean, I I grew up in a family band that, that had hard times, but. We always had love, and we always had the Lord in the house. Um, you know, we, we, we started with, you know, all gospel. We played um, played in church a lot. Um, we, we then, you know, got into more secular kind of bluegrass, played all over the States. Um, and then I, I switched and played another instrument I'd never played before. I didn't even know how to mic it. Like, it's okay what's going to happen here and then all of a sudden momentum builds and and you know i i i learn and it's empowering to to know that you can learn something totally new and you can do it at a professional level if you want it bad enough you got the fire you got the the opportunity you can rise to that challenge and uh you know i i've i've been very blessed to have a phenomenal family around me from the get-go um, and a loving family around me now uh, and tons of friends, fans, and, and professional relationships that have gotten me further than I ever thought I could go. You know, uh, so I, I, feel very you know, I think that would be one I would enjoy. As uh, you think about like what you guys do, you're amazing songwriters, amazing our players if you could pick one of them and share that with the younger you a 10 year old you what would what would be the most important one out of the three would you share with your 10 year old self uh, we're getting Bobby. some clicking it's hard to hear you a little bit i didn't really catch that whole question michelle would you mind repeating that for me yeah so the fact that you guys are both amazing songwriters singers and guitar players what is uh what is one you only get to pick one that you would tell your and kind of instill into your 10 year old self to encourage yourself to do at 10 years old out of the three 
I, I would say songwriting. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think of myself as a great songwriter. You know, I've, I've written a few songs. That's something that I'd really like to do more of. Um, you know, just if I could go back, you know, I'd say pay attention to things, you know, really let, soak, th- soak things in around you and, and write music because, you know, those songs are going to be around long after you're gone. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you, you know, when we're gone, people can still hear our records, but our songs can live on forever if other people choose to record them. So I, I'd say for me, it would be the songwriting aspect. How about you, Rick? Um, I, I agree that, uh, songwriting, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it definitely is, is around long after you're gone. If, uh, if, if anybody listens to it, which I, hopefully they're listening to a, a couple of my songs, <laughs> they're definitely on the radio, but, um, you know, I, I got, I got started in songwriting pretty young. I think I, I started writing when I was like 15 or 14, um, and, you know, they weren't any good for a long, long time. <laughs> but, um, you know, the Ferris family recorded several, several of them. And, uh, you know, I, I think if I had spent more time early on, I, I would have have been better, you know, um, obviously. But, uh, you know, I, I got into it so early. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think I would have told myself, though, that, uh, you know, having family, it, it takes a lot of time. You know, uh, if I could have told myself, you know, uh, 20 years ago, hey, you know what? Eat, sleep and live this right now, because as soon as kids come along, that's worth the distraction. You know, it's a lovely distraction. It's an amazing distraction. Uh, right. But it is hard to get in practice time now. Uh, you have to make a concerted effort. You have to plan it you know, into your daily time. But, you know, uh, I, I would say, um, you know, I, I, I had so many hours jamming and hanging out and practicing. Um, if I could have had any more of that, I, I would have been super excited, but I feel like I've been blessed to have everything that I've had so far. So, um, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. I probably saw that do a little more of that. But uh-huh. well, as uh as we're uh, winding things down, um, I want to make sure you guys know I truly appreciate you guys giving me your time, um, today. But um, again, special consensus nominated for four IBMA awards and uh, Carolina Blue nominated as well. Uh. Make sure you guys tune in World Bluegrass Virtual uh, Week um, as Special Consensus. Rick Ferris will be performing. Of course, Rick Ferris has got his brand new album off of Dark Shadow Rec Recordings, um, Breaking in Lonesome. I got it right there. Look at that stylish man there. And of course, uh, Chicago Barn Dance with Special C. Um, folks got to go to their websites, snag those up. And of course, uh, it, it's white and bright in here. So I, I apologize. There we go. It's somewhere in here. Um, <laughs> the Carolina Blues uh, brand new album as well uh, take me back so you know you guys definitely take everybody back into a, a different time with the music you guys put together um, by songwriting and collaborating with your bandmates um, so the one one last thing I want to ask you is other than me who in your life do you wish you met sooner Bobby. Um, I could say there's a couple of people, but, but my wife, Kayla, you know, I, I wish I'd, I'd have met her about 20 years sooner. Uh, she's really been a blessing to me and is my biggest supporter. And, uh, I, I hope he's watching, but I've got a good buddy who's become a best kind of a best buddy is Nick Chandler. And, and uh, everybody knows me and him, we're pretty close. We've gotten closer over the last few years that we've known each other. And I, sh- I remember being a young young man going over to the Shindig on the Green in Asheville, which uh, in Asheville, North Carolina, they do it at City County Plaza. It's a big jam session uh, during the summer every Saturday night. And I remember as a young picker going over there, 
and I would just ease up and listen to Nick Chandler and Bobby Hicks and Mark Kirkendall and all these guys playing, and never would dream, to, you know, they, they were, I was in awe of those guys, and uh, and Nick's been a good friend, and we, we bounce ideas off each other, and uh, we do a little gossiping and chit-chatting about every day, but so I'd say, I'd say old Nick and my wife Kayla, I wish I'd have met them both sooner. How about you, Rick? Um, well, actually, I met my wife in high school. Actually, no, I met her in eighth grade. <laughs> but um, uh, our our uh, music teacher stuck us right next to each other because she had perfect diction and was classically trained. And, and I grew up singing in a family band. And I, I, I learned to speak down in Arkansas. So I never opened my mouth. And he said, sat her right next to me and said, you elbow him every time he doesn't open his mouth. <laughs> so I met my wife really early. I'm I'm super blessed to have uh, have uh, known her for so long and had her by my side and enjoying our lives together. Uh, she has been a, the best blessing um, for me. But um, I, I would have to say two people. If I could have met them earlier, I mean I know you said one, but uh, it would have to it's be okay. two for me. Uh, Stephen Mojan, you know, I met him when I was a kid, but he wasn't uh, he wasn't the Stephen Mojan he is today back then. He was uh, playing with Valerie Smith and Liberty Pike with Becky Buller. I met them both at the same time. It was in Central City, Iowa, and I was I was uh, I think about 14, 13, 13, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, I wish I could have met Stephen of today back then and been like, teach me, teach me everything. You know, I mean, he was a great player and singer back then, but he wasn't taking on that teaching role that he is now. Um, and then the other person I would say is my writing buddy, Rick Lang. Um, getting to know Rick Lang, he's also up for, I think it's mentor of the year for the special mm -hmm. awards. That the, yeah. So um, Rick is just, he is like chi embodied <laughs> he is very calm and relaxed and everything just flows off he's got a, a good sense of faith about him he's got a good head on the shoulders and he's an extremely good writer and i um you know i feel like i've really clicked we write every week together not only uh, am i excited about what we're writing but he's just a great guy to visit with and i've really oh, yeah. come to know him well and uh He's a cherished friend. So I wish I could have met Rick much earlier. Um, but, you know, there's so many folks we meet. It, it's hard to, to label them as Paramount Pinnacle. I wish I could have met you earlier. Well, you know, you guys have seriously, it's been so, so exciting to be here with you guys and having you guys part of uh, Real Talk Bluegrass. And, you know, I, I, you know, it's always fun to kind of get a little more real step a little side away from the music, add the music in and everything. But I uh, want to encourage everybody to check out carolinablueband.com, billyblueRecords.com, also uh, Special Consensus and Rick Ferris' websites and also Compass Records and Dark Shadow Records. All the great places that you could uh, load up on all the great music. And again, Special Consensus nominated for four IBMA Awards, Entertainer, Album, Song of the Year, Collaborative Recording of the Year, Carolina Blue nominated for New Artist of the Year. You guys, you know, this that just shows how much people truly love your music and what you do. Um, and we cannot cannot wait to see what the, the night will unfold during the virtual awards show with uh, the International Bluegrass Music Association. And, you know, we encourage everybody to, again, follow you guys on social media and uh, check out your guys' websites as well. As uh, you know, we wrap up things here with uh, Real Talk Bluegrass. Bobby, Rick, thank you again for being part of the show. Thank Thanks you for so having me. Much. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's great to see you again. Thank you for having us on here. Well, it's been a blast. And again, um, the next episode is going to be uh, August 27th, another wonderful Thursday evening. And we're going to do, do another husband and wife team kind of thing. And uh, with Kenny and Amanda Smith and Lauren Price Naper and Scott Naper. So we're gonna have another fun filled uh, bluegrass uh, 
Real Talk Bluegrass coming up in two weeks. So hopefully uh, folks will tune in. But, uh, you know, I encourage you guys uh, to keep on doing what you're doing and keep us posted on, on everything and anything. And Rick, again, congratulations with Kent and everything that you guys are doing with the new baby. And Bobby, you guys got an amazing album. Both of you guys have amazing albums out. So um, we just wish you guys all the best uh, with World of Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank Thanks. you, Michelle. All right, everybody. Me, buddy. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us.